Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, uh, it's beautiful out here in Oregon. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful day, and I mean, it's all nice, and people are out and barbecuing and all kinds of things, and and uh, you know, it's just really exciting. But you know, we got another exciting issue. It's called Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know if many of you know where that, that area is, but that's back east, and I mean, that is the talk of the town, if you will. And uh, you, you can turn on media, social media, or you can turn on any news situation right now. There's, they're discussing that whole issue in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, that's going to be the direction of the show tonight. We're going to basically take that, and we're going to discuss that. I'm not going to tell you more than that. I'm going to suggest that you pick up the newspaper, or you pick up the social media, or you pick up the news, or this, that, and the other. If you don't have CNN, or you don't have Fox, and whatever. But really, that's really where all this thing is all about. And uh, I could spend more time on that end of it, but that's not what we want to do at this point in time. What we want to do, we want to bring it back here to, to Portland, Oregon, and talk about some of the specific issues that are relative to that situation that's happening in Baltimore, in Baltimore Maryland. It was said, uh, they talked about housing and, and the black community and this, that, and the other. Home ownership is always key if, you, if you're if you talking about a community. And many, in many ways, blacks, in, from a historical standpoint, was able to go down there and get a Cadillac get behind the Cadillac, but not, but not real estate. And so um, uh, we're going to just kind of, and so I, I've got with me today a gentleman that has been very, very much involved uh, back when uh, uh, into the whole issue of the Northeast community. He's a realtor by trade, and he happens to be here with me now, Fred Stewart. And besides that, he, he's a former, former jar here, too, Marine. <laughs> and it takes that kind of a situation sometimes to get things done. But uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to give Fred an opportunity to kind of share. We're going to, we, he and I, between I, we're going to sit down and share with you sort of the history of the black community from a, from real estate and home ownership. I want him to speak about real estate and what the, and where this community is today. So he's got that history. So that's what we're going to do. And again, as usual, as you know, I'm donning my cap again, my Vietnam cap, and I'm still encouraging those vets that are out there to get down to the VA and register for your benefits. It's very, very important for the families of vets and whatever. That's very, very important. That's one thing that the VA doesn't do. You would think they've got the DD-214 already. All they have to do is just put them on the, put, put, actually, actually certify them, if you will, register them, send them their cards, and give them their benefits, and they come in the mail. But you've got to physically go out and, um, and, 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 and file for registration for your benefits. So, hey, get, the, get them out there. Okay, with that, Fred, welcome aboard. Hey, thank you. Bruce. How's it going? I know you were working today, and uh, and you you made this special effort to come here and and spend. We're just going to spend about a good thirty minutes with you to start with, but okay. we want to thank you. But like I said, he's probably one of the top realtors here in the state of Oregon. Uh, very very enthusiastic, very aggressive. But the whole idea, he wants you to own some of that property, and yep. that's very. Important. I want everybody to, everybody to buy a piece of the Oregon. Very very much so. Well, Fred, let's go back in time from the standpoint of. Uh, uh, you know, just come up with that history about about the black community, normally the IE in the Portland area, northeast Portland aspect of it. Let's talk about home ownership. Let's talk about uh, when there was a predominant number of blacks. When did they start owning property? And when they started this exodus, you know, you hear the words about gentrification. Mm -hmm. You're talking about all of the government money that, that poured in this particular area. Well, PDC is a good prime example as Portland Development Commission. That was designed, if you will, for home ownership for black folks. I mean, we can talk about that, too, a little bit. But why don't you just spend whatever you get. Let's talk about your knowledge about that area. As it relates to well, first off, I want to address the myth that inner northeast Portland was ever majority black. There were okay. streets. Uh, maybe a few blocks here or there that were majority black um, occupied or owned, but inner northeast Portland has never been majority black. It's mm -hmm. always had majority white population. So uh, people have got to understand that when they're looking at the history of northeast Portland, that um, first off, black people were forced to live where they were living in inner north and northeast Portland. They didn't have an option um, in living in southeast Portland, living in southwest Portland, there there were a few exceptions here or there. Why was that so? I know the Vanport. You know, we, 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 we yeah, Vanport. Talk a little bit deal. about Vanport. Well, when Vanport occurred, I mean, Vanport, the way a lot of black people that I grew up around looked at it, Vanport was um, the, the, uh, the attempt by the city of Portland that they looked at it 
uh, to wipe out all black people. Mm -hmm. They wanted black people to leave. Mm. In 1946, there was actually uh, meetings held uh, with black leaders of the time, both the NAACP and the Urban League, with um, very prominent white people. Um, I was even told the mayor was, in part of, was part of some of these talks at the time, mm -hmm. to see what they could do to, to help black people leave Portland. You know, Portland's got that attitude, we'd love you to visit, but please don't stay, and please don't tell your friends, <laughs> you know, where you were. Well, after the war was over with, we had, um, you know, a larger pop, the largest population, actually, I think it was even probably larger than today. Yeah, yeah larger city. We could, have, we could have had more black people back then in Portland than we do today. We have a white here too, and that was an integrated community. It was integrated, kind of, it was separate, but unequal. But still, the, okay, the, right. the majority of black people in Oregon at that time lived in Vanport. And um, so a lot of black people, when Vanport occurred, and they were forced to live in the in inner north and northeast Portland. Let's just say a lot of the younger kids grew up not looking at northeast Portland as a home because their family didn't choose to live there. Um, some made the best of it. We've got some black families that took advantage of the white flight that occurred because the white flight did occur shortly after Vanport. When, when the city allowed black people to move into inner north and northeast Portland, um, a lot of white people said, great, this is my opportunity to leave. And um, there were some problems, you know, there were some problems in some of the nicer neighborhoods, you know, Irvington, uh, Walnut Park, Piedmont, um, Elliott, believe it or not. What about uh, financing at that point in time? Well, the up until the 1970s, most financing for everybody was done on seller contract, okay. you know, um, so they didn't need to go to banks. Where blacks were hurt was black, white people, after they owned property, mm -hmm. they could go to a bank get a loan to put a roof on, get a loan to paint the house, get a loan to invest in themselves to make their home better. Black people generally didn't have that opportunity. Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why you had a lot of black people who owned a lot of real estate. The real estate wasn't necessarily in that good a condition because they didn't have the access to their equity mm -hmm. like black people do, to, do today. Um, it wasn't until the 70s, 80s that most people started getting mortgages. And even when I started selling real estate in 1988, um, I'd say in inner northeast, half of all the homes that were sold were sold on either blind assumptions hmm. or a seller What's contract. What's a blind assumption? Well, blind assumption is something that a federal loan used to be. You know, you could literally sign the loan over to somebody else uh, for a fee. You pay the government like 500 bucks. Uh, there's no credit check, no nothing. They would just have to be American citizens and hmm. above the age of 18. Hmm. And uh, it was really easy. Uh, the only problem we had back then was a lot of these homes that people owed more against them than the mortgage, and uh, I mean than the than the value of the house. So the mortgage was was you know thirty or forty grand. And the house was worth five or ten grand. Wow. So a lot of people didn't take advantage of blind assumptions because they didn't know how to didn't know how or didn't feel like they needed to try to figure out how to work out the equity. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, right now is the easiest time for black folks ever in Oregon to buy a home. There is no excuse at all. There is no redlining, so to say, as they say. Um, I haven't seen any evidence, and if you ever do, please call me, because that's a lawsuit I want to be a member of. Mm -hmm. um, even the white people in the industry right now are very cognizant of it, and um, I've seen white brokers get lose their jobs because the company owner or the company manager didn't feel that their uh, employee, and you gotta remember, loan officers are usually employees, um, was being equitable and fair. So that's a very big deal in the state. So if you ever find somebody that you feel is being racist towards you and you can prove it, call me. I'll help you prove it. You'll put it together. And we will have, uh, after we get that lawsuit settled, we will have a very big dinner at Al Gauchos. <laughs> well, well, what about what about government uh, promotion, pro programs that basically were, were actually advertising from the standpoint of, of home ownership? Well, you well, know, the, the, the problem PDC with a lot of the programs over the, since, I'd say since the 80s, yeah. we had black flight in Oregon, in Portland, in the 80s. Uh, if you open up my yearbook from 1983, you'll see an awful lot of black folks I graduated from high school with haven't lived in Oregon since the mid-80s. Hmm. We had a lot of black flight. So imagine that going on in the community. What was the, what was the reason? They didn't want to live here. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to, you know, they, they, didn't like the, the, they didn't like the state of the black economy at the time, mm -hmm. what they felt were opportunities for black people at the time. They definitely didn't want to be around gangs and stuff. Gangs have done more to push black people out of inner north and northeast Portland than anything else. You know, if you're a man and a woman and you had kids and you, you, you wanted them to have a better life, the last thing you wanted them to do is associate with a family that has black gang members in it. 
you know, unless you're strong like my mother. And my mother, you know, knew that uh, I knew that she could take me out any moment that, uh, you know, she felt I wasn't living the life she felt I should live. And I still feel that way. I'm 50 years old. And my mother's 78. And I definitely feel my mother would, uh, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> the fact that I'm here means my mom's o okay with how I live my life right now. <laughs> you know, but what I'm saying is a lot of families, you know, not to get to that point, to be proactive, they found opportunities to move out of the neighborhood mm -hmm. and they did. And I, like I tell everybody what I found when I got into real estate, the hardest people to sell real estate to in inner Northeast Portland were black people. Hmm. If they could afford for me to help them get into a house in Beaverton or Gresham, anywhere but inner Northeast, they would. I sold homes for over 100 black families in inner Northeast Portland, and not one of them ever were offended <laughs> at anybody paying them what they wanted for their home, whether they were white or black. They just were very thankful for the money, and they took that money. And that was a, a beautiful thing. For, for a while, that hurt my feelings, you know, all these black people leaving. But then I understood from the stories I heard growing up this is a beautiful moment. We have black people who are now determining the future of their families. They're not being told. Black folks, you got to be over there. You got to stay. You got to find some houses in those blocks over there. You know, I grew up hearing about Dr. Unthink. You know, somebody, my grandfather, my, my grandfather trusted Dr. Unthink unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And when Dr. Unthink moved into Southeast Portland, my grandfather was one of the guys that did what he could mm -hmm. to make sure that Dr. Unthink's family was safe because the wealthy white folks in uh, uh, Southeast Portland did not like this doctor, this black doctor, being their neighbor. And they showed it both verbally and physically. Mm -hmm. And uh, they never hurt Dr. Unthink or his family, but a lot of, th lo mm -hmm. a, a lot of threats. And, uh, you know, Dr. Unthink made a little money selling those houses, <laughs> getting out of there. But, but, let's, but, but let's I want to tell you something. Black Ten years thing. later. Let's get back. Wait a minute. Let's, let's get back to the community aspect of mm -hmm. it. It is still being recognized as the black community. It was recognized as the black community then, and a lot of federal dollars came in as a result of being identified mm -hmm. as the black community Correct. in terms of boundaries, right? Correct. Yep. So what happened? Are you, are you saying that there was a flight that was a mass, that was made to flight, if you will? Correct. So who was getting the benefits of of, quote, the black community. The property owners, and a lot of them are still black. Um, you know, you go to Alberta Street. But the majority of A lot are, of those properties are owned by black folks. But, but the majority? The uh, majority is white, because the majority of the population is white. But, yeah, white people took advantage of the opportunity uh, to cash out or cash in. Some white people bought more real estate. Um, white families that I sold houses to in the early 90s, they took advantage of those programs. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, from their background and their family background, they understood that gentrification was in progress. If you've lived in any other major city in this country and you came to Portland, Oregon, uh, let's say January 1990, if you didn't understand what was going on, you're not very smart. Because what we're going through, many other cities before us have gone through, and there'll be, we'll see gentrification in other areas of, of Portland. Let's define it to the viewing. What do you mean, gentrification? What gentrification mean? is when an area has depleted. You got to remember, inner northeast Portland was the place to live between about 1910 and 1950. That was the place to live. Uh, some of the neighbors we we have in here. Um, and that was flight during that time that you're talking about? Well, no, that's when white people moved into the area okay, moved, okay, and, and, and developed the area, okay. cut down the trees, as okay, they say, yeah, and everything. Yeah, okay. um, black people, of course, would love to have lived in some of these homes back then because they were the you know some of the best homes in the area. But the numbers weren't there. The numbers weren't there. The weren't there. No. After the war... Um, the shipbuilding, too. They, they, yeah. they, a, lot of, a lot of employment. After, after, after the war um, and the efforts to get black people to leave, I mean, physically leave town. Mm -hmm. um, well, you had the flood, too. We had the flood. Point. Some, where were some, these, some say where, something might have happened in that. Where were, the, where were the black people going to go? Mm -hmm. And what the city council at the time, what I was told, and what the city leaders at the time, they didn't want to see black people living in their backyard. You know, they didn't want to see people all over the, all over the city. So there was an understanding that, they were, that black people were going to stay in inner north and northeast Portland. Okay. And we had, um, you know, at the time, it's you know, necessity. you got to live someplace. And, uh, you know, some black people said it's better to live here then, you know, fight and try to live someplace else when we can go right over here. Plus, you got to remember, some of these houses were pretty nice compared to where a lot of these black people had come from, Mississippi, But the Louisiana majority of those folks who were working in the shipyards left. They, they got them majority out of here. Majority of them. They got them out of here. Yeah, the, major, well, the, the, shipyard, uh, the shipyards depleted really quick, not just for black people, but for white. So a lot of people left Portland, black and white. But you're right. The first people to lose their jobs 
were, were the black folks. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? White folks did leave too because they lost their jobs, but they lost their jobs after the black folks did. You know, one guy told me that he could tell the war was definitely over because there was no more work. I mean, that's literally how we put, how we put it. There was no more work. And the fascinating thing is the black people knew that was going to happen. The black workers in the shipyards and stuff like that back then, they knew when the war was over with what, how, how things were going to be addressed. They knew as the, the white guys were coming back from the war, um, if there were any jobs left, that they were going to... Um, you know, be replaced. That's a good way to put it. So they knew no matter what, they were going to lose jobs. I think a lot of black people were probably planning on, on leaving anyway without any type of enticement from the city. But, you know, we had a lot of racist white people. We have a lot of racist white people today, but we had even more back then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, they were just scared to death that all, as, as my grandfather used to re refer to them, all these jigs were going to stay around here mm -hmm. jigging up the place, mm -hmm, you know, as he used to put it. And uh, my grandfather said, you know, that... Uh, you know, I asked him, you know, why did he stay when so many people, you know, wanted him to go? He goes, well, this is my home. I'd been here, over, you know, almost 15 years by then. And um, I was going to be one of the last jigs on the boat to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about some other little areas. And this is prime real estate. You know and I agree. Very we're, prime. We're, it, it was uh, prime back then. What about Emanuel Hospital? I mean, you remember Emanuel and all of a sudden, the, there was, I mean, that was the, 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 the so-called black community, so Correct. to speak, as far as economics is concerned. Correct. Businesses and this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, some things happen. Yeah, well, some of the same people who were trying to get rid of black people in the late 40s, early 50s, um, were part of, of the whole, um, was still part of this, the power structure, the city uh, uh, government, the, the state government. So it's no surprise that Emmanuel Hospital would do what it did, or it, it was used to to do what it did, which was basically displace black people again. But this time, there's laws. Um, not every white person was on board. You know, it was easier before to move black, black people, um, you know, in before times, as they say. At that time, it was a little harder. You had lawyers. You had the civil rights movement going. Um, it was harder. So they, they, they used the urban renewal to do it. They used the urban renewal as a, as a um, they call it a... a an enticement mm -hmm. for black people to sell, for black people to give up their property. Um, they use them in the domain. They use, well, they use them in the domain, but even, but even when you use them in the domain, you're paid, you know, um, uh, something for your property. And they use that against he heavily against, or the threat of it heavily against black people then. But what stopped it, because uh, it could have been a lot worse than it was, was, you know, we had a lot of people now who are more educated. Mm -hmm. We had yeah. white people who were stepping in, stepped up and said, no, you're not going to do this. Um, it could have been a lot worse. But that was really the, the last punch in the eye the black community had when it comes to real estate as far mm -hmm. as white people saying, black folks, you can't have this no more. Mm -hmm. you know. But it wasn't as bad as when they kicked nor black people out of Northwest Portland or South mm -hmm. Southwest Portland. They were much more aggressive th there. Oh, yeah. uh, they used the cops to do that. Wow. <laughs> you know, wow. They were uh, more aggressive when they kicked black people out of where the Memorial Coliseum is. Yep, where yeah. the Memorial Coliseum is, I mean, that was... I tell people if, if even a quarter of the stories that I grew up hearing are correct, I mean, that's, it's bad. Let's, let's just say it's bad. Yeah. And uh, but they, we're talking about the last times. After that, black people got more, um, uh, let's say, smart, more intelligent. Uh, right now, as ever, we've got the most educated, most sophisticated black population oh, yes. in Oregon. Yeah. So are you surprised when a black person here decides they don't want to live in the inner northeast and wants to live maybe um, in a nicer, you know, neighborhood, when I say nicer neighborhood, newer neighborhood in some other part of the, of the market, you know, why not? You know, where would they buy if they didn't live in, in Portland? Mm -hmm. If they moved to California or to uh, Seattle or to Chicago, what neighborhoods are they buying in then? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I look at what's, what's going on right now is a celebration for the city, celebration for black history. Um, you know, the only thing I want more is I want more black people taking part of it. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell people all the time, I, I think everybody should own real estate in Portland. But the people who got the biggest um, motivation to do it are the black people in Oregon. Black Oregon should be um, have an insatiable appetite mm -hmm. to buy as much real estate, that, 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 as much as long as they can afford it, for them and their families. But now but now we're sitting up here today, getting, getting current here. Now we're sitting up here today, and, it, and it's been said in the, in, the, in the written documents and the news and this, that, and the other, 
that many folks are coming here from California and mm -hmm. and from from back east, and you know they they've sold their million dollar house, if you will, and then come here and pick up a house for two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. like that, renovate it and flip it for another half a million and buy another house. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I don't those see, things are happening. Th those things are happening, but I'm, I'm seeing more people selling in other markets. Uh, and then moving here and taking that money they made in other markets and buying a house here because we're still, for a major city of the top 25 major cities in this country, we're still one of the most affordable uh, to buy in. Now, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can live on my street. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to live on my street, you better have at least 450 grand to 500,000 or you're not going to get into my street. But there's lots of streets in Portland. Lots of streets in Portland you can get into still for 200 grand. Still, <laughs> the availability is still here. Yeah, you may not be, you know, within a 20 minute walk or 10 minute bike ride to downtown Portland, but, you know, Portland's a great city all over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we still have a, a huge amount of, of, of affordable housing stock. That's why I tell people you're going to see gentrification, not just in inner Northeast. You're going to see it pop up in other areas. And this gentrification that we're going through right now, even in inner Northeast Portland, I, I remind people, the, the, the people that are white that are moving into this neighborhood, they are different than the white people I grew up with. Mm, They're higher educated. Okay. They are uh, higher income. Got money. Well, more experienced. Uh, more everything. They're, they are more like the people who developed inner north and northeast Portland back when Mr. Killingsworth was alive than they are the people who I grew up with. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a total economic hmm. turnover hmm. going on in inner northeast and inner southeast. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I always laugh at. I tell people, they go, you take southeast Portland. I went to Washington High School, which is now Revolution Hall, um, and Cleveland High School. And you go into those neighborhoods around those schools. And th back then, there were very few black people that lived in those neighborhoods. But the white people that live over there today tend to be more educated, more experienced, better you know, employed than the white people who lived there when I was in high school. And I tell folks from Southeast Portland all the way up through North Portland, you're looking at an economic turnover. If you just base it just on, on race, you're missing most of the story mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. going on. But this is not the last time it's going to so happen. So are you say, suggesting that, that this myth about the, the areas being gentrified, people are moving out to Gresham and are being forced out to move in the Gresham area. What percentage of blacks are, uh, what, what do you think the percentage of blacks are in the inner Northeast now? Oh gosh, I would expect around 5%. Around 5%? And, and look, uh, in his heyday, how, most many, how black, many were there? We got more black people for the first time in about 70 years. Uh -huh. We got more black people living outside of Portland. Outside of Portland? Outside of Portland. Like where? In the Gresham? Uh, is um, yeah, Gresham. Um, um, Happy Valley, Milwaukee, uh, all over the place. Owning their homes? Um, a lot of them do. A lot of them do. A higher percentage are buying homes in those areas than what we had as far as home ownership 20 years ago in inner Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing I tell people to point to. When I started real estate in 1988, we had about 500 or so, between 500 and 600 vacant and abandoned homes in inner Northeast Portland. A lot of those homes were owned by black folks. Okay, a lot of them were owned by, by black people. Mm -hmm. the, their black family members, their sons and their daughters didn't want to live in them. So mm -hmm. they, did, they just left them vacant. I've sold homes in inner north and northeast Portland between 88 and 91, um, where people have been squatting in them for you know a decade or more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the house is vacant, they moved in. Believe it or not, the families kept paying the property taxes. They actually looked at it as a plus, you know, because they couldn't sell it for anything. And they had somebody living in it, and they looked at it as, hey, this is a mutually beneficial situation. Then when I go to sell it, a house that a lot of times you wouldn't know was a squatter's house, uh, you know, then I have to deal with all the entanglements of, you know, right, of right, that, right, you know, right, because right. one day somebody gets a letter in the mail from a realtor or for an investor, and that says, hey, this house that was worth $10,000 uh, three or four years ago, I'll give you forty for it. You know, a lot of people said, hey, show me the money. Mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and those black people that got that money, I can't feel bad about it. I mean, it would have been better for them to, I think, long term to keep the property. But, you know, uh, nobody when they were when black people were forced to move into inner northeast Portland, it wasn't for their benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't for, hey, we're going to yeah. give you the most right. valuable piece of property in Oregon because we think this is best for you. Uh, back then, the, the way the city was was planning was going it was going away from development in in, in the cent center core I call it mm -hmm. uh, Portland. They were looking at 
developing outside of downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. So they were basically giving us what they thought were going to be the leftovers. Mm -hmm. And the, it wasn't until the 70s that flipped. And when it flipped, oh my God, you got all these black people own this real estate that one day is going to be worth a heck of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the intention mm -hmm. in 1948 and 49 and 50 when all these these decisions were made to allow black people to move over here. So housing is available. Housing Home is available. Home ownership is available. Home ownership is available. No problem. Throughout the market. The, the financial institutions are ready to make the loans. There are, they, they are, they're the competition to get money on the street, as they say, mm -hmm. is, is, is higher than it was 10 years ago. Okay. I tell people, everybody, um, this is a great time to buy. Don't feel like you got to live on my street. It'd be great to have you on my street. But don't let the fact that you can't get uh, a house close in right now hold you back. Because this entire city over the next 25 years is going to be gentrifying. If things keep lining up the way they have for the last 40 years and it's looking like they're going to, you got areas right now that don't seem that attractive right now but are well located. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people, pull out a map. You can see where the growth of this city is going. Go ahead and buy and wait, like a lot of the people I sold homes to. You know, I've sold over 700, and I say, was it 738 addresses now? 738 addresses in inner north and northeast Portland. The first 400 people. They bought homes in this neighborhood when I was selling them for well under 100 grand average. We had gangs, we had drug houses, we had hookers on three streets. <laughs> you know, they bought early, they got in early. And, you know, thank God that they didn't sit around and go, well, I'll wait till it gets good and then I will invest. If they had done that, then they would be able to sit around doing what a lot of people are doing right now. Wish they could have when they should have, you know, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Mm -hmm. So now they're renting. So what about multi-housing? Okay. You hear the big deal about the house, about HUD, and we, we, don't, we don't have the availability for housing, and the mayor is making the point. That well, that's is. an area where the city and the state could do better. The, the, the city and the state have done a horrible job working with black investors, black developers, and, and, and helping them develop HUD projects around this, this state, around this, especially this market. You know, I tell people there are areas of improvement. And that's why you need to, to, to not lie to yourself about what things are and what things have been. Because then you're going to miss out on where you can really apply uh, you know, influence and pressure. Uh, black developers such as you, um, Chad Devnum, I, even, yeah, right, I would right. even say the coalitions and stuff. Uh, not so much speaking for them, but saying I, we're not seeing the support. You know, uh, I'll say it again, my, my friend Ray Leary, guys like him, they don't get the support. Mm -hmm. for doing de uh, commercial development mm -hmm. that they should be getting, mm -hmm. especially when a lot of the money, a lot of the dollars have been brought into this market are for not just developing low-income housing or, or I should say affordable housing, but to help black people have a say in some of these projects. Um, black people are pretty much ex excluded out of urban renewal zones. Ur urban renewal zones are pretty much a white-only domain, and we're talking about Depending on who you talk to, since 1970, it could be anywhere between five to seven billion dollars um, has been spent on urban renewal zones. I gotta be honest; I know it's in the billions. I don't know how many billions. But Pretty even billions. if it was one billion, if, even if it was just one billion, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they spent less than one percent, one would say one percent of one percent in partnership with black people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so I, I I say the power people in the in the state who are almost all exclusively white, going from the governor on down, they've got a responsibility to reach out to black uh, investors and black developers and business owners and make sure that they are part of the process, right, too. Right, right, right. But right now, well, there's no discrimination about Joe's. that. What about the Trader Joe's piece? Oh, Trader Joe's is a mess. You know, I, I, we've already talked about that in the show, yes, and, right, and it's still did. a mess. Yes. It's still a mess. And, uh, you know, what they should have done a, a year ago, but they wouldn't do it because we got some, some, some black leadership issues in this state that I'm hoping, you know, God does something about one day soon. Um, they should have just given it to Ray Leary, who's the reason why Trader Joe's is going to go on that corner. Well, Chad could have done the job. Well, Chad could have done it, but what I'm saying is they should have gone back to, to, to Ray because he's the one that brought that deal yeah, in. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he and, did. And said, Ray, right. bring it home. Right. Develop right. this. Right. He's got the smarts. What happened? Well, he's black. You know, if, if he was white, I, I have no doubt that that's what they would have done. But because he's black, he's second fiddle to white people, and he's second fiddle to 
do nothing black folks and stuff like that. You know how it goes. But what it, you're telling me now, it's not Ray, easy being a black man in Portland. But, but it's fun. But you, what you're telling me now, Ray, get back to the table. Ray, bring Ray Chad, back, to get table. back to the table. Chad, get back to the table. Gina but not Willard, just that. Get back to the not table. just that. I want young black people out there to not be afraid of, of investing in real estate or being in the real estate industry, or even if you're not in the real estate industry, invest in real estate, invest in your families. Because when you invest in real estate, you're not just investing in, your, in how you live and your lifestyle today. You are reaching out and touching your children and your grandchildren. And, it, and that is something that the World War II generation of black folks that, that were forced to live in inner Northeast Portland, mm -hmm. that's why so many of them bought so much real estate in Northeast Portland. Well said, folks. Well said. As you can see, we're doing something as a result of the Baltimore situation. We are sort of ahead of the game. The idea oh, is we're get, much better in Baltimore. But get back to the table, right? All right? Get back to the table. Fred, thank you very much for spending the time with us. I'm going to get you back on here. Okay? Thank you, Bruce. All right, buddy. All right. Just sit where you are. All we're right. going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with our guests. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back again to Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here, and, and I've got another two guests. Again, we're continuing, if you will, the discussion or the, the follow-up as a result of Baltimore, Maryland. I mean, we got Portland, Oregon here, and, and we, rather than taking the other end of it and basically talking about what they're doing over there, what are we doing here in the Portland metropolitan area or the state of Oregon as it exists today? And um, so people need to know that we did the first part with Fred and the real estate peace aspect. That we're going to probably do more of that because there are some other issues there that we can we can follow up on. But this time around, education is always a key. Well, you know, when you start thinking about the whole, when you think about Baltimore aspect, I'll throw this out to you. It's always about the dollar. If you can't make a living, if you can't if you can't have a job, Absolutely. you you can't really even have the real estate. I mean, even those even though the availability is there. Fred still used the word gentrification, and those people who are being gentrified don't have the money. They don't have the job. In most cases, they don't have the education and things of that nature. So we're going to be focusing uh, in, in some of those kinds of areas to kind of give folks an opportunity to maybe come back, or if not that, make sure that the city fathers, if you will, in those outside areas are responding to what their needs are. Otherwise, we're going right back to the same issue with all the other problems. Okay, we're fortunate. We don't have that many problems. We don't have the kinds of problems that they were having up in the Baltimore area aspect of it. That's a big job. That's going to be a big job. But I will say one thing. I say, from the standpoint of the leadership they have today, I've got to admit, I've got to admit, those three black women, those two top, those three top black women are the top, the toughest. You got the mayor who happens to be an African American. You've got you've got the um, uh, the police chief, not the uh, police chief, who's a male, but you got the mayor. You've got the attorney. We got the the state attorney. She's a, she's a, she's African American, and you also have the attorney general, the attorney, what well, the general, the U.S. the U.S. general, what the national guard. Yeah. yeah, right. The adjutant general, the adjutant general of the national guard. I mean, I mean, it, it's it's just unique. I can go on and on, 
just talking about their background and how they got there. We're in good hand, as one would say, with Allstate. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, what we're going to do now is that uh, I've got two people here with me right here that we're going to spend a little time on education and education from one standpoint that John here has been around for quite some time. You've seen him on the show. He's running for the Portland Public Schools District uh, on the board, for, for the board. And I've got Glendora Clay, Claybrooks, who's here. She's now Oregon, and uh, she is now the representative, if you will, of uh, uh, the representative of the National Action Network. And if you don't know what that is, it's Al Sharpton, and that's who he is. And I and I, I will say that Al has been part and parcel, if you will, of bringing this agenda to the table and talking about issues that we can hopefully at some point in time we can all be called Americans, and we're all benefiting equally all across the board. And so that's a very important piece. So we want to welcome welcome Glendora here, and what she brings to the table, because as 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 you know, as you all know, that I am the, I am to be the chairman of the engagement committee for the Republican Party. And as far as I'm concerned, it's not about the the big elephant; it's the little elephant sitting <laughs> in the corner. It's about the issues. Yes. It's about issues. And so that's what we're going to do. And and I'm basically saying to the party, uh, it's just a small few that uh, that basically is still out there. To the majority of the Republicans in this state, they want what's right. And I will say that to even to the Democrats, and the, whoever they are, it's about what's right, and that's what we've yes. got to do. And so we want to welcome. We got we got her here. She's doing two things. One, she's going to be educating us re real briefly about, uh, uh, well, just maybe some feedback on what uh, uh, Reverend Sharpton or the National Action Network thought about uh, Baltimore. Get your fill in a little bit. She knows that. But the rest of the time, though, she's going to be edu she's getting educated, and that's why I'm bringing her on the show and making sure she understands what's going on here within the state of Oregon. And John, on the other hand, is going to spend a little time on education. He's going to help us out a little bit. He's running for Portland Public School. Normally, uh, this is the largest school district in the state of Oregon, and uh, the majority of, uh, in all due respect, majority of the population of, of African Americans go to Portland in, in, in the Portland Public School District. And there's a high failure rate there. Mm -hmm. And that's been an issue that we've, we've had here on, on the Voters Digest and talking to that particular issue. So John's going to be kind of an asset. His background has been here, so he's been trained real well right here on the Voters Digest. And so, so, so what we're going to do, let's jump right into that, John, with reference to uh, uh, your, your running for the school board. And let me, let's, let's target one particular area, which I think is very, very important. And I'll associate that with, with an issue that, that was a major concern here within the city of Portland. It was the art tax. The art tax. I mean, people are trying to feel, well, we, well, what are we doing being taxed with this art tax aspect of it? Kind of like an addition to the rent. I always, I always use tax as a rent as opposed to tax. It's rent, paying rent. But people are trying to figure out, where is the benefit for Oregonians across the board here in the Portland metro area for the art tax? And uh, my shot, and, and we've talked about this before, was it's the art tax, and then, but at the same time, what about voc ed? We don't have voc ed here in the Portland, Portland Public Schools. Uh, we used to have it, but only for one school. And voc ed is very important, especially when you start talking about low-income kids or just kids who don't have the availability of having their, their parents or attorneys and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is that voc ed has always been a way of, of getting them enthusiastic about learning the the, you know, the, the, the three R's, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic aspect of it. So anyway, that's been an issue. And so John here, uh, we're going to spend a little time and kind of get a sense of uh, what, are, what are some of his issues uh, that he's going to be, what his platform is, uh, if, if in fact he gets that position on the school board members. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that he, he spends a little time on that voc ed piece aspect of it. John, sorry about that. <clears throat> Not trying to put words in your mouth, but for the benefit of Glendora, I thought I'd throw something out there. Uh, <coughs> Well, I'm running and and, uh, and emphasizing finishing high school, right. and because the uh, finishing high school is the key to your future. Because the thing is, in, like in my case, I got out of high school and I went to work, and then later became a National Guard officer, and college was good. So then I went to college. Being a high school graduate, I just showed up. If I wasn't a high school graduate, I'd probably would have had to spend about a year or so being qualified for college and I would probably would, and I wouldn't have been a uh, National Guard officer. So that's really important about finishing high school. The other thing is uh, statistically somebody comes out of high school and then they go to work and the Oregon minimum wage at uh, 925 an hour is about $19,000 a year. Statistically by the time that person is is um, uh, 30 years old they're making about double that so they'd be at about $38,000. But the thing is, but the, and they 
talk about, you know, you get a little more with associates, a little more with the bachelors, and so on and so forth, but they're not talking about if you don't finish high school, then the deal is you're going down and you're going to be hitting there at minimum wage and it may not be full time. So the deal is your annual income might only be $15,000 a year. And that, that's terrible. See, So it's bad enough being at the minimum wage level. So the thing that really makes a difference is that you come out of high school and you have a driver's license and a voter's card and a draft card for the guys and, and you have some voc ed, vocational education, uh, because you've in school, uh, I got some of the vocational, you know, shop in, in grade school, in the seventh and eighth grade, and then I went to Benson Tech. You know, when I got out there, I had some physical skills, so I knew what a wrench was, and I knew what a hammer, and different kinds of hammer. So, but know. Benson wasn't available. The concept of that particular voc ed mm -hmm. piece was not available to the rest of the schools, right? That's right. And then what they did do in the years after I had graduated. Uh, I didn't finish at Benson, I finished at Kubasaki on Okinawa, but anyway, they started having shop classes in all the schools, all the high schools. You know, you know um, I have a foster son now who's a uh, mechanical engineer, and he was in uh, shop classes at uh, Franklin High School. And uh, so he was, uh, when he ha had that experience, and then he had a brother that had a wood shop, and another brother that had a uh, uh, okay. machine shop, when he come out of mechanical engineering, he had some physical background. Okay. So he but what about the poor kids? But this is the thing is that we What have, about the poor kids? Is, is that your concern, one of the concerns you have? My concern is the whole shebang. Yeah, but what about the poor kids? What are you going to do? There, what are your concerns about Portland Public Schools? You're running for office. Yeah. What are your concerns wanna, about Portland Public Schools? I want schools? everybody to to excel, you know, whether, whether and it's real important for all the children to excel and because it's a benefit to us and the parents need to emphasize to the kids finish high school because the thing is the parents got to look at it and say you know later on that kid's going to have to take care of you you know and if they got a fairly good job they can do a good job of taking care of their parents and i know when okay but now let me but i'm not trying i gotta catch you we gotta get something going here okay you're on the school board now mm -hmm. What are you going to say to the rest of your school board members and to the public about your concerns? What are some of the concerns that you're going to be taking to the school board to, if you will, to resolve? Okay. Like what? Specific? Again, it's, it's graduating from high school. Now I was on the Multnomah Education Service District Board, and the, most of the kids that dropped out didn't drop out because they couldn't handle work. They dropped out because they were bored. And some of my experiences in schools, some of the real smart kids could help the kids that are a little slower. It makes the, the smart kids better and it helps the younger kids and it deals with their okay, they're working so what, together. But what about the teachers? What are they going to do? <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're going to be kind of like the circus master running this thing. And the emphasis is to have all of these kids to finish high school and especially get the voc ed and, and the fact that the, you know, the uh, a lot of them, say, you know, when they're taking math and they're taking different things, they says, well, how does this work? Well, you get out there in the shop, you know, the deal is all of a sudden the math. So, so one of the things you're going to do is you're going to basically promote, you're going to be pr trying to promote, if you will, voc ed going back into the school district. Oh, yeah, because it really makes a difference. Cause Nursing, we need, uh, was it uh, food, well, all kinds of good stuff, right? Because we need people who can fix things and build things. We just can't be a service industry. But then also there's a motivation, too, about the enthusiasm for poor kids. That if they're in, they're in wood shop or this, that, and the other, they'd have to understand about the reading, writing, arithmetic in order to be able to do the task, right? Right. So therefore, they'll be, more, they'll, they'll be more into basically graduating, if you will, as opposed to the failure. We don't have it here, right? That's, That's right. right. So what, 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 other, what another concern? Any other concerns that you may have in regards to the, the school district? You're running for office. What, what are the <laughs> other concerns? Give me well, another concern, specifically. Well, the other thing is, is that they, they're, uh, this next year they're going to start uh, school before uh, Labor Day. Okay. And the deal is, the society is in here is geared for school starting on Labor Day because it, they're uh, scheduling family vacations and all that around that. But the thing is, that's secondary. But the main thing is, is getting people to graduate from high school. Get that mantra on there when a kid comes to school. Let's go back to that piece you're talking about, this this vacation deal. What about the kids? You know, some people are saying they're not getting enough time in the, in the, in the classroom. Well, what about they, that piece? They moved, moved it this side of, of Labor Day to get more days, but they can move the days on the other 
other end of it. You know, I was with the parks for 33 years, and the deal is, we said, you know, summer really didn't start until July 15th. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not interested in the parks right now. <laughs> and what, what, about the, what about the superintendent? You, recently, we, people were very upset about that, that pay raise she got and some of the other so-called administrators. It's not going into the classroom. No. What are you going to do about no. that? What about those teachers? Well, the thing is, this morning, following your suggestion, I got on a computer and I got to the part about uh, Carol Smith's uh, raise, okay. and I got down to the comments. I thought my computer was going to melt. I mean, they're really um, jacked out of shape is really a polite way to put it. I mean, you know, the, the thing is that the, and they're, they have got away from the traditional way of they do the... Who's the, making most of the money? Are the people in the classroom doing the teaching no, or the administrative side? Who's making the most money? It's a superintendent. She's making she's making two and a half times as much as the governor. Which is how much? She's making two hundred forty-seven thousand dollars a year, as against about ninety-eight thousand dollars a year. Jesus Christ! And what about what about the teachers who are on the high end? The, the average the average is on the uh, high end. Okay, the average is sixty-two thousand, and they start at the very bottom at about thirty-eight thousand. And if you got a, a doctorate at the very top, you'd be at about seventy-nine thousand. But For a doctorate. PhD. Don't do this. And it'd take a long time to to uh, get that, but they they work it up, and uh, real quick, right? It'd take them about twenty about years. 20 years. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, look, I, I know I know you do have a, a platform, but I want to spend a couple few minutes here now with uh, with with Glendora and kind of give the give the viewing public here a little opportunity to get a little feel of who she is, and and that uh, we want to welcome our board because it's uh, it's about engagement. And get the issues together, put the issues together, so we can solve some of these problems. <laughs> Glendora, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Why don't you just share share with them real briefly uh, about your little background and how you got here, so to speak, and then get that message from Re Reverend Al Sharpton and Ezra Zate, how you related to this this whole issue of uh, of uh, women in Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, thank you, Bruce, for having me. My name is Glendora Claybricks, and I am the president of the National Action Network. Portland Beaverton, Oregon chapter, founded by Reverend Al Sharpton in 1991. As such, uh, we are a social and civil rights organization, and uh, Reverend Al um, is the uh, serves as the mega voice box for uh, mm. people of color and poor people. So there's not just one ethnicity that Reverend Al focuses on. He's uh, concerned primarily about uh, social and racial justice and uh, lack of inequality and um, uh, lack of equality and equity and health care equity. So uh, we focus on uh, criminal justice issues, housing, education, uh, and even economic development because these are the areas that make up our society as well as the political uh, um, sector uh, uh, piece of this. And we know that uh, black Americans are the, uh, are, are the primary population that uh, suffers from the uh, in social and racial injustices. And this just did not occur since President Obama became president. He, uh, this happened many, 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 many years, hundreds of years ago. So the fact that we're still struggling trying to attain economic equality is really, uh, in our opinion, just unacceptable. Uh, we uh, have gone from building the country to uh, being, uh, um, uh, to, to being victims uh, mm -hmm. of it. And so this is why uh, Reverend Al speaks out uh, against all social injustices, such as what's going on in Baltimore, mm -hmm. Maryland. And how do I bring this full circle? It's going to be difficult, um, but uh, I would say that uh, the things that, the, the thing that happened, the police officers and Frederick Gray and the outcome of that is not anything new. This has been happening over the last 400, 500 years, but what is new is technology. And so technology has enabled us to see close up and personally how these in, injustices occur. Mm -hmm. And so I say often the change we um, seek 
will require us uh, focusing on a uh, change of attitude, uh, our uh, um, practices and our behaviors uh, as they are unequally uh, demonstrated by the behaviors that we've been videotaping and the police department themselves have been videotaping of the interactions with people of color. And uh, that is what uh, is most disheartening. So we have to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, I often say that we as a black society did not get uh, sick by ourselves, so mm -hmm. we're not going to heal mm -hmm. by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole new language that now we have to come to terms with in order to get the correct messaging out. And I interact with all ethnicities, the white ethnicity, the Native American, the Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Japanese, all of um, the ethnicities that makes America the melting pot. And over the course of the years, I've had to uh, provide medical services under the auspices of the physicians that I worked with within the healthcare community. So what I'm saying is this, that we all have cultural uh, insensitivities and the propensity to uh, not recognize or acknowledge. But we're going to have to uh, start to acknowledging the uh, the the uh, black Americans um, uh, hardships because this is what Baltimore was all about. It wasn't just because of this one incident with mm -hmm. Freddie Gray. This is a long time build up because the systems are designed to oppress and suppress, although. They're not designed in the same manner they were back in the 1920s and 30s, but the, the rules have changed. And so now we're being oppressed and suppressed according to the policies and the um, guidelines and rules that's been set forth not to um, provide economic equality or education or equal housing, but to control. So as long as you control a nation of people, then you have um, the power right. and you retain the power. And so uh, until we start to put people, more people of color in leadership positions, and I'm just saying a director over a certain um, community-based organization, mm -hmm. I am talking about we need to start having trust and, and, and speaking to uh, the to to the uh, people of color to empower them so that they can feel uh, confident in themselves and so that they have received a well-rounded education and not has just been based on European principles but principles from people from someone who look like them who talk like them and who act like yeah, them. Right, right, and right, so right. this is what we are uh, looking forward to. This is what the Boston upheaval is about. It's a build up of uh, over hundreds of years and generational poverty. So now these young um, people are angry and uh, this is how they're trying to uh, atone for uh, justice. Well, Glendora, I tell you, we want to welcome you to, to Oregon and uh, we're looking forward, if you will, to, to gatherings, if you will. And uh, to talk about the issues that are, that are relevant to here at the same time. And I chatted with you before, you are very interested in, in reaching out to other organizations and, and uh, you know, basically working with them or whatever, sitting at the table to talk about the issues. And actually, one of my interests would be uh, to see whether or not you can get uh, Reverend Sharpton here. We've got some, we've got some pretty um, um, enthusiastic uh, uh, talk show hosts. We got uh, we got Lars Larson here, <laughs> and boy, that would be a, a very oh, interesting yes. one. You know, you're, you're familiar with Lars. Yes, that would be a very interesting one. And very. in fact, Lars would welcome him to to come on and do. In fact, I'll even do the hosting. <laughs> that? Oh, sounds good. <laughs> and we got Victoria Tap, and that's good. on our side. But we also have uh, uh, the on the other side too. We got both in. So my point is that just to really t see if we can identify the issues and see if we can resolve some of these problems. Yes. And the reason why I brought that issue up with Reverend Ralph Sharpton. I can remember the day when I was still doing a show and uh, Minister Farrakhan was, came to town, one, one of the first time ever that he came to Oregon. And I happened, had the opportunity, if you will, to interview him and had the opportunity to sit down with him and chat and whatever. And then at the end of the day, we had issues with the gang issues and this, that, and the other. And so he had his diocese, and the like, had his, uh, he had his, his gathering, if you will, uh, downtown. And one of the things we had talked about was the whole issue of the, the gangs and this, that, and the other. And he had, 
He had both there, the Crips and the Bloods, and, and they're all sitting together <laughs> and communicating with, with one another. And I, I was just excited about that. I mean, the fact of the matter is that he was able to do that. And yes. I even went to some of the folks here in the, in the city of Portland and Oregon and said, well, look here, why don't we just hire him? <laughs> we, can solve, we can solve a lot of our problems, if you will, <laughs> if we can just hire. But a lot of folks didn't want, want to do that at that point in time. Yes. But now, as I think back, you think about the, 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 the kinds of folks he took off the streets and, uh, you know, got these young men to respond to their families and the like and put a suit on and a bow tie and sell newspapers. Boy, I tell you, <laughs> I was impressed. I mean, all the issues about dress and this, that, and the other was solved. So I'm just saying, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. Yes. And, uh, and, I, and like I said, that's the way I sort of look at um, Reverend Sharp. He's going to be bringing some people back to the table. Yes. He's out there with the rest of those talk show hosts. Yes. Everybody's got opinions. Right. Everybody's got opinions. Exactly. And, and it all depends upon, uh, if you will, the uh, your background, right? Yes. yes. And exposure. Yes. That's what it's all about. So that's what we're going to do. So we want to welcome you here in Oregon and we will do everything we can to make sure that the viewing audience get a feel for in Oregon get a feel for what you're doing and how you're doing whatever and I and get the other way you're new so you got an opportunity to say and do what you want to do John is thank here that's you. why you're here with John too okay thank you but we want to thank you for being here with us and again folks please receive her well and and hopefully all these other organizations she's gonna be reaching out I know she's re reaching out Absolutely. I know she's reaching out right now but it's about the issues and yes. that's what it's all about. It's about the issues, our young folks. Yes. It's about jobs, livability, whatever. Yes. And we got a beautiful state here yes. in Oregon. And I'm still reminding of uh, Governor Tom McCall, who again was a Republican. Yes. He said, look, we got a lovely state here, but visit, but don't stay. <laughs> don't, don't mess up nothing. So, so I know you're going to be a very positive entity to this area. And we want to thank you very much for, for being there with us. Thank you very much. Thank okay. You. Good night. Thank Welcome you. aboard. John, again, it's a pleasure. And hopefully you're going to. You're going to be doing the best you can, and I don't know what happened. I don't know the results of the the, the, the election, but but if you're there, fortunately, uh, you know, hey, you'll be there. But if you're not, still go to the school board meetings and do whatever you can to to make some change. Is that okay? Make them nervous. Just All right, good there. enough. Well, thank you very much. You got John Sweeney, and you got the other candidates that are there. But the whole idea, understand what the issues are about, and then question the folks. That's what it's all about. Find out what they're going to do. I.e., bottom line, the education of our young people, getting them jobs, and this tax thing on this art tax is about bulk eds across the board for everybody in this school district. I think that's very, very important. Again, thank you very much, John, for being a part of this deal. And thank you to you, voters. And by the way, you're going to be getting your, the, this, the, the, you're going to get your vote in the mail aspect, you're going to get your mail aspect of it. And it's very, very important that you take the time out, if you will, and call those candidates, ask them the questions to make sure that they are responding to what you're talking about, okay? With that, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Oh, by the way, we're going to be closed the month of May. I'll see you in June. See you around. Have a good one.